weight stigma is real. It is a real experience. And so it is maybe more painful for you to have an eating disorder than it might be for a thinner person, right? Like that there's a kind of an added layer of discrimination and shame. Hello, welcome to The Seasoned RD, a podcast connecting newer professionals in the field of eating disorders to those of us who have been around for a while. I'm your host, Beth Harrell, a certified eating disorders registered dietitian and supervisor. And I'm Abby Brown, a registered dietitian who is newer to the field. I think of myself as a well-seasoned cast iron skillet with wisdom and experience, yet always ready for something new. And I think of myself as an Instapot with innovation and a fresh perspective. This podcast brings both to the table to share ingredients, recipes, and techniques of past and present so we can all be our best for the future. The kettle is heating up. The skillet is on simmer. So join us around the table for true professional nourishment. Abby, ready to stir the pot? Let's do it. Hello, and welcome to the Seasoned RD Podcast. I really think if you've been following this show, you're going to laugh at me again because each episode that I'm ready to release, I think I say, this is the best one ever. And this one is the best one ever. (laughs) I hope you'll listen to it. I hope you'll listen to it again. I hope you'll pass it along. I hope everyone, anyone, no matter what your profession, working with anyone who comes to us for weight concerns can listen to this episode and be open to the message. Our guest is Dr. Erin Harrop, who has experienced treatment for anorexia nervosa at both ends of the weight spectrum, and their lived experience is eye-opening. Erin was interviewed for a New York Times article called You Don't Look Anorexic. About halfway through, I think I'm going to listen to this part over and over and over again to let their language sink in about introducing weight inclusive care to clients who seek our services with weight concerns. Erin's words are so powerful when they come to us for weight loss and this is in response to Abby's excellent disclosure of feeling uncomfortable in these conversations and a reminder to those of us who've been around for a while this isn't just Abby each client is different so we will make mistakes. Anyway Erin's words to summarize to our clients is hey, you know, here's how I do my work. I am going to make mistakes. I'm deeply committed to giving you the best, most ethical, most proficient care that I can. And I'm going to keep showing up. And if something happens as we're working together that makes you feel uncomfortable, please let me know because I'm learning too. I want to do the best I can to not cause further harm. So that's it in a nutshell. If you listen to know more than that, my message is complete, but I think you're not going to want to stop there. As a reminder, we're wrapping up this podcast end of May in 2023. We have a handful of new unreleased episodes in our vault that you will not want to miss. So please continue to join us. A listener comment from M hold 27. I can't respond to you in the podcast itself. So I'm responding to you here. M hold 27 says best podcast. I absolutely love this podcast. It is so helpful to have a podcast specifically for people who work in the field of eating disorders. I've learned so much from the guests on this podcast. I always have to have a paper and pen with me so I can make notes on what I'm learning. So helpful. Thank you for this podcast. Well, thank you. M hold 27. We appreciate you listening. And then anyone else, please consider joining my next supervision freebie live information is in the show notes. Welcome Erin Harrop to the seasoned RD. We're so happy to have you. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. I can already tell we're going to have some great conversation today, but we'll ease you into it with some icebreakers that we've got. So my first one for you, mountains or beach? Beach, 100%. (laughs) I live in the mountains though, but I miss the beach. (laughs) I get that. And then breakfast or dinner? Breakfast. Absolutely. Especially if it's a late, late Saturday, easy brunch, you know, homemade with the kids. Love it. Mm. That sounds nice. It does sound nice. It's more about the, like the event than necessarily the food, but you have time on Saturdays. It sounds (laughs) like audio book or paper book. Both. If I am wanting to like really luxuriate, then a paper book that I can put my hands on and feel the pages. But for my everyday life, 
audiobook is a lot more accessible. So I read more audiobooks, but I enjoy more paper books. <laughs> okay. And there's there's middle ground. So what we're talking about is kind of either kind of binary questions, mm-hmm. breakfast or dinner. And sometimes people have breakfast for dinner, mountains or beach. Some people like the lake. And so, you know, I love that. So both. So Aaron, you are an LICSW and a PhD. I imagine that one or both of those included, I'm going to bring you back to maybe a traumatizing moment because we have people <laughs> listening, professionals who are just in their studies or are brand new to the field. And so they're taking their board exams. Mm-hmm. Can you bring us back to one of those days and what, what you remember from it? Of the board exams? Oh. <laughs> I remember just being obsessively worried about getting there on time. So I think I was about an hour early, which allotted me a lot of time to go there. I actually got a a cake pop from Starbucks and I saved it as like my reward. Like I I got the coffee before the exam and then I saved the little cake pop because I was like, as soon as I'm done. I'm going to reward myself with this little, I love it. I think it, yeah, it was, and it was like some animal or something. Um, <laughs> it was, yeah, how, it, how long was it? And was it paper or was it computer? I believe it was computer. And so, and this was just made in 2020, I think when I took it. Oh, so okay. I'm relatively newly independently licensed. I've been practicing for I think nine years at this point, but I, I did my licensure hours while getting my PhD. So it took me a bit longer and yeah, I, I remember many, many practice tests and many, many preparation meetings with my coworkers and just that relief when you see you passed on the screen. Yeah. So it would have been computer because I did like, it did let me know that day that I had passed. So yeah, it can be so anxiety producing because when, I mean, when, when I took my exam, it was paper and pencil. It was that long ago. And so that's what we're bringing in as people who have been in the field. Janice, probably you, uh, we have Janice Baker with us again, yes. one of our guests from the, from the podcast, and she's joining us with Aaron Harrop. So we're super excited. Definitely paper, pencil, and snail mail. Yeah. <laughs> so Aaron what made you get into or what, you know, how did you decide to become a uh, social worker and then get your PhD and then get into eating disorders? That's a big question, but I want to hear your path. Absolutely. It, you know, honestly, I've, I've known I wanted to do something like this since I was like 16 years old. So I have my own personal history with an eating disorder. And at that point in time, we did not have mental health parity. So we did not have any laws that said that people deserved mental health care. And I also had a family that was uninsured and low income. And so in, in my story, I just struggled so much to access any care at all. And the care that I did access, much of it was really harmful. And I you know, remember I wrote my college essay on how I wanted to make a difference in the eating disorders field. And it has been a very long winding road to get me to this point because it was many, many years of work and recovery and, and relapse and trying again before I was able to get to a place where I was healthy enough to do this work. But, you know, sometimes I give a a little very professional answer of like, oh, I practiced in a children's pediatric hospital. And I, you know, saw all of these patients being overlooked by physicians, but the, the real reason is also motivated by that, that personal experience as well. We like the real reason (laughs) because back in the day, people didn't talk about their own lived experience. And I'm so grateful for so many things, right. That, that parents are included when they need to be and that we can talk about lived experiences because that that's what brought you here and we're grateful. So there's a lot of things that you do. <laughs> One of the things that we haven't touched on enough on this podcast for therapists, dietitians, nutrition, other nutrition professionals, medical providers is atypical anorexia. Mm-hmm. Can you 
I mean, you were at, you were quoted in an article in the New York Times recently, mm-hmm. or did you write the article? I was quoted. <laughs> okay. Do you want to tell me what that experience was like? Absolutely. So there was an article, I think it was called You Don't Look Anorexic, which is actually one of the most popular quotes from my dissertation, which looked at people who had anorexia. And that was a a comment that people who had atypical anorexia frequently heard from loved ones, medical providers, random strangers (laughs) when they disclosed their eating disorder. So this article was kind of examining the story of several patients who have struggled with atypical anorexia and then some of the controversy around the diagnosis. You know, working with the journalist was really fun. She is, it's always a little, as you said, Beth, sharing your story, especially with the greater public and sharing a stigmatized story in terms of it being about mental health. And it's specifically relating to the fact that I'm in a larger body, right? Like those elements are really challenging to talk about in a public way. It's challenging to talk about as a professional, because even though we have come a long way, people still, you know, they might say that I'm doing me search, you know, research about myself, or that I can't be an impartial evaluator, which I agree with. And yeah, I think it, it was a very vulnerable experience. It was hard not know whenever you do an interview, you don't know how they're going to choose to portray you or your story, you know. And and one of the things that I was a little saddened about was that some of the article took more of a a deficit approach, which is understandable because we want to draw attention to this. But I was a little sad that like all our pictures just showed us looking very sad. I wish that there had been a little bit more joy and hope portrayed in some of the visual images. So those were kind of my, just what it was like for me. Yeah. Cause you, I, as you say yeah. that I'm picturing what it looks like and we'll include that article in the show notes so that people can know what we're talking about. If you haven't seen it. Mm-hmm. But it, well, I, I agree with you. It felt like they were showing some sadness and well, and part of that can be from weight stigma, right? When you said, absolutely, you know, random strangers can Mm -hmm. say you don't look whatever. And I, Mm -hmm. all of the hate mail that kind of came from, from the article and people Mm -hmm. who really don't understand, I, Mm -hmm. that just, oh. Yeah. I make it a habit not to look at the comments section of anything that I publish or especially in the general public sphere, although academics are not always that much easier. (laughs) Yeah. You know, and yeah, it's, that's the way our culture is sometimes. Totally. And then there's something that you did for your thesis that patient provider communication and based Mm -hmm. in weight stigma. Mm -hmm. So this all fits in really nicely with the whole atypical anorexia. What kinds of things do you want people to know about how to communicate Mm. well with their patient? Well, I I think one, (laughs) some of the things were just so basic, you know, things like believe your patient when they report something. And that that is challenging in eating disorders. I don't want to just state that without giving it any nuance because we know that people with eating disorders struggle to recognize their eating disorder and they struggle to recognize the seriousness of it, right? And so, you know, when we hear things maybe about a report of how much someone eats or exercises or purges, we we often, I think, as providers, because of the eating disorder kind of lying and chattering in that patient's ear, we often have to make some educated guesses about how truthful that patient is being. But I think in the case of weight stigma, the default assumption is often that people in higher weight bodies are eating more than they are reporting and exercising less than they are reporting. And from an eating disorder treatment provider perspective, I actually find that the opposite is often true, that for my patients with eating disorders, even when they are in larger bodies, they, and perhaps especially when they are in larger bodies, they might actually over-report what they eat or under-report what they exercise because there's that discounting from the eating disorder that says, oh, that wasn't real exercise, or, you know, I'm just going to round up and say that I ate 
a whole thing, even though I ate half, just so I can be sure about my calories, right? And with higher weight populations, there's that added layer of they've been told their whole lives that they eat too much and that they don't exercise enough. And so that layer of stigma, I think actually makes it even more complicated. And and I had this happen multiple times in the study where people would, you know, report, oh, I think I binged and I would ask them, okay, well, tell me about it. Tell me what you did and, and how much you ate and what the situation was. And, and it wasn't a binge at all. Right. So in the eating disorder world, we talk about subjective binging when we maybe feel out of control with a normal or small amount of food. And when a fat patient, or I will start with a thin, when a thin patient says like, and they have an eating disorder, oh, I I binged on Pringles. You know, a provider might say, okay, let's look at this. Maybe you just had, you know, a, a snack of Pringles, right? But if a fat patient says that same thing, oh, this weekend I binged on Pringles, Often a provider might just assume that that's that's a legitimate statement without doing any further investigation to the contrary. So yeah, number one, I would say believe patients. So when a patient comes to you, says I have an eating disorder or these symptoms, or I'm concerned about my eating or body image or restriction or purging or exercise, like take that seriously. And if you're going to disbelieve the patient, bring the same healthy curiosity that you bring to that thin patient, right? You know, if you're like, oh, you know, I'm not sure, right? Like, like keep just because the person's in a larger body, don't forget your eating disorder had at home, right? So that should come along with you. Another thing in terms of provider communication is we know that most providers in general, but I think this is particularly pronounced in the eating disorders field, I don't have data to support that, but I have a lot of anecdotal data from going to conferences that, you know, our healthcare providers in general tend to be thinner than the general public, which is also a reflection of weight stigma in things like medical school admissions and who is able to survive things like internships and practicums. But in the eating disorders field specifically, we also have a very thin population of providers. And so one of the things that patients consistently said worked for them in my dissertation when they were working with someone who was in a different body t- type than they were was when thin providers acknowledged their thin privilege and acknowledged that they, because of that, they had different experiences than the patient. They were treated by the world differently than the patient. And that acknowledgement of that kind of social power differential was really powerful for patients. So if if you're in that situation and maybe you're a thin provider working with people in larger bodies, that acknowledgement, one, you know, that I am in a thin body, so I do get treated differently. And two, that weight stigma is real. It is a real experience. And so it is maybe more painful for you to have an eating disorder than it might be for a thinner person, right? Like that there's a kind of an added layer of discrimination and shame. Those things were things that patients said were really helpful in communication. And then I, I, lastly, I would probably, and this might go with that first one in terms of the, when not to believe your patient (laughs) and that, that is to get specific, right. To ask those questions, you know? So for example, in my study, I, I followed several, many, well, 39 individuals who had atypical anorexia and one, it is not uncommon for people who have anorexia or kind of anorexia spectrum disorders to binge. That's not uncommon. That's, I think, represented in about 30% of cases in the literature. But I did have one patient for whom binging was not, had not been like a, a behavior that they had struggled with during their diagnostic interview. And they reported to me that they had binged on Pringles. So I'm coming back to the Pringles here. And, you know, I I paused and I asked them, I said, okay, well, well, how much did you have? And she said, I had a whole can, right? Like expecting a gasp, like, <gasps> turns out I asked her what the day had looked like and how she had that can. And it turns out that she had eaten a can of Pringles the entire day with a couple, like one chip, like every 20 minutes kind of thing and nothing else during the whole day. That is not a binge. That is not an out of control, short period of time. What that is to me as an eating disorders provider is measured survival eating, right? That's the the IV bag of 
nutrition that's putting a little drop every couple minutes to keep the blood sugar up for this patient. And that is kind of what she was kind of doing for herself as someone active in the military with a very high physical regimen, right? So in in situations like this, we have to get specific and ask those questions. Just like we don't trust an eating disorder to give us an unbiased view of what a patient is eating or their behaviors, we have to also not trust the eating disorders of our higher weight clients too, and kind of do that background work, dig into it and figure out what is actually happening for that patient. And that, you know, it goes for things like exercise reports, eating reports, and finding ways to ask those questions in a way that's not, I don't believe you because you're fat, right? Oh, you know, like not having that automatic assumption of, I don't believe you really only ate half an apple, right? But having that be like, you know, eating disorders are tricky. And sometimes people with eating disorders struggle to to have an objective view of how what they're eating or how much they're exercising. And I'm really concerned that you might not be getting enough nutrition or that you might be getting too much activity for your current nutrition level using that lead in so that you're kind of dispelling some of those weight stigma beliefs right at the start and putting that patient in a place where they can more honestly and truthfully answer from their wise mind instead of their eating disorder mind. This is so, I mean, I'm like eating this up, but I can't imagine for even newer professionals in the field that this is such a good, not even a reminder, because it's probably the first time a lot of people are even hearing this. So I kind of, I want to dive in a little bit more into those three that you've mentioned. So first of all, how and when would you suggest that a practitioner acknowledge weight stigma or weight privilege? How would you, Mm. how would you guide that? Mm -hmm. So I I think it is going to depend just a little bit on the situation, you know, I'm, so I'm going to assume maybe that these are patients that kind of in a what I might call a more typical or standard dietitian relationship where you might be meeting with them on an ongoing basis for a while, as opposed to maybe like a very brief encounter in a hospital where you're doing an intake and then establishing some kind of meal plan or something. So in that kind of situation where you're doing that ongoing relationship, I think I I think it's very possible to acknowledge it from the start, from the first appointment. When you are talking about your approach to nutrition and wellness and how you do dietary counseling and that kind of thing. At least for me and the professionals that I've worked with, often people like either talk about either a non-diet approach or a health at every size, or how do you handle weight? When you're having that conversation about how do you handle weight, which probably is happening in the first appointment for almost everybody, because that's such a key reason that so many people are are seeing dietitians. I think that's an ideal time to acknowledge like, you know, the care that I do around nutrition and body image and exercise is all informed by a perspective that tries to integrate how societal discrimination like weight stigma impacts my patients, you know, and you can also include in that statement too, that it's not just about weight stigma that influences how we feel about our bodies. There are other kinds of discrimination that influence how we feel about our bodies, whether that's racism or sexism, homophobia, transphobia, and that you're explicitly doing your practice, trying however imperfectly to address the effects of weight stigma while doing that and realizing that the work that you're doing in the dietitian room, it's not value free, right? It's not a neutral intervention ever. And that you're always kind of taking a side in some of these debates about weight and wellness. And that, that for you, from your practice, that you're trying to do it while attending to those other pressures. And in that conversation, you can also say like, you know, one of the things that is a challenge for me doing this work is that I'm speaking to you from a place of privilege, right? I'm speaking to you from a place where I'm in a thinner body and I don't face the same discrimination that some people do who are in larger bodies. And I see that as making it even more my responsibility to try and provide ethical care to everyone that's attentive to these other pressures that they're facing. So, you know, and, you know, some patients are going to be 
more or less familiar with some of this like social justice language. So I think you can, you know, try and step it back unless someone has already experienced explicitly said, like, I'm coming to you because you do it this way. But I think in that first appointment, you can acknowledge that and then you can come back to it. You know, when we have conversations like, you know, oh, I I really want to challenge you this week to have a meal out. Or I really want to challenge you this week when your mom suggests this, that you eat this way, that you just push back and say, you know, oh, my dietitian wants me to have this. When you have those conversations, remember the context of weight stigma, that people who are in higher weight bodies, they're going to have different reactions from their family members, right? It, It means something different for me to order a cheeseburger at a restaurant on a dare from my dietitian than it would be for my thin daughter to order a cheeseburger, right? She is going to be treated differently in that situation. So continuing to kind of attend to those, you know, what are you worried about with this, this challenge or what are, you know, uh, being able to attend to that throughout your relationship? As you, you are saying all of that, I'm envisioning myself as the practitioner bringing this up and it feels uncomfortable. And Mm -hmm. I think maybe this is part of the reason coming from we don't get a lot of eating disorder education and dietetics. And it it seems like our assumption to deal with that was like, okay, well just don't acknowledge weight. Like just see everybody, like get your blinders on. You're just talking to the person. So I, I think that's part of the reason why it's uncomfortable. So what would you say to people who are feeling that way? It absolutely is uncomfortable. And I'm so glad to hear you name that experience of like, that kind of maybe default expectation that we either get through our own practice, like avoiding something that's uncomfortable or from like explicit instruction that we might've had for, for people who have told us that the best way to deal with stigma or discrimination is to ignore it or to not acknowledge it. And well, one thing I would say is that ignoring discrimination is a privilege of people with privilege. And we see that. And I, I I know that from my own experience, right? Because I didn't, start really wrestling with what it meant for me to be a white person until my master's program. Right. And that's a lot of years lived. And that is evidence of my white privilege that it took me over two decades to really start to engage with race in a more critical and serious way. And so I I just want to acknowledge how hard it is to to have these conversations and how much of a normal default it is to go to that place of like I just like we'll just I'll focus on the issue at hand I'll take a you know a weight so we use the term colorblind right in some circles so we might take a weight blind you know and we see that right like with language like weight neutral care and that's part of the reason why I say weight inclusive instead of weight neutral is to acknowledge that we can't just treat everybody exactly the same. We do have to give different considerations and we can still have ethical care even with different considerations. Ethical care might mean that we have to do care a little bit differently for people in larger bodies. So yeah, acknowledging that, I would say that practice, 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 practice saying it to a friend to a mirror, practice saying, acknowledging it in your regular social interactions. It doesn't have to just be in the clinic. You can start bringing this when you're talking with your dietitian friends. So you can practice having those conversations, acknowledging that, that thin privilege and seeing what happens. The other thing I would say is that I am all, and this is part of my clinical style, so it may or may not fit yours, but I am somebody who in these moments speaks from the heart and acknowledges like, you know, this is, this is a really hard dynamic. And I just, I want to acknowledge this. And I know that as somebody, you know, with thin privilege, who doesn't maybe quite get exactly where you're coming from, that I'm going to make mistakes in our, in our therapeutic relationship. And just know that I am deeply committed to giving you the best, most ethical, most proficient care that I can. And I'm going to keep showing up and, you know, 
if something happens as we work together where you don't feel comfortable, please let me know because I'm learning too, right? And so I, I tend to be a little bit upfront with my and vulnerable with my own discomfort and just acknowledge that this is hard and I'm going to mess up and I want to do the best that I can to, to not cause and further harm. So I, yeah, I think when you, when you speak from the heart, when you practice those interactions over and over, and then sometimes you might have a patient that you've worked with for a while that you have quite a bit of rapport with. You can always ask for a little bit of feedback. You know, I'm, I'm really curious how, like, I'm really, I'm learning about this. This is new for me and I want to do better. How was that conversation with you? How could I do it better? Or with, you know, a colleague or a supervisor. So, but yeah, I, this is hard. And I, I will say too, that I, I have been very blessed to have a couple of providers that uh, personally that I have worked with for at this point, over 15 years. So they have been on my care team for a very long time. They have seen me through typical anorexia and atypical anorexia. We have a lot of rapport and none of us started out our journeys in the place that we are today. None of us started out with the knowledge that we had 15 years ago. Like all of us have been on our own kind of journey, learning about stigma for me, I went from like zero knowledge to like getting my PhD in it for my providers. You know, I think they were always like very good, kind, ethical, well-educated folks. And they have grown tremendously in terms of their knowledge around weight stigma over the years. And we've had breaks in rapport along the way, you know, moments when we've talked about weight and it hasn't been handled in the best way. Mm -hmm. Moments where you know, I might have received promises like I'm not going to let you get fat. Oh, right? things like yeah. that that we can't. You might be looking at someone who's very thin, and you just like even even if that's been their growth trajectory their whole lives, you know, if their eating disorder has been a part of their life since they were very young, like mine was, like we just we can't make those predictions. So we are going to have those breaks in rapport. We're going to have those moments where we say things that years later we regret, or moments later we regret. And we can repair, we can repair it too. We can come back the next week and say, you know, I realized last week when we were talking about weight, like th that I just, I don't feel like I talked about it in the best way that I could have. And how was that for you? What did you take away from that? Maybe they weren't harmed at all. And that's fine. That's great. Move on. But maybe that reestablishes some of that rapport that could have been ruptured if, if they did take it, take it in a way that they did experience harm. Oh, Erin, this is so, I've, I've got so many things circled on here as I'm taking notes and I'm thinking about linking into Dr. Jenny Copeland's episode where she talks about her privilege and she practices from an RODBT mm -hmm. kind of approach and the weight inclusive. So you may know, Erin, that the dietetics curriculum is changing and there's a weight inclusive toolkit happening for students because dietitians do feel sometimes like, well, if we don't have weight management, what do we have? And it's like, oh my gosh, there's so much <laughs> there. I mean, for example, I spent a 50 minute session with a client in a larger body who's been struggling with eating as a, as a child from a mm -hmm. young child. And she cried most of the session. And we talked about food very little because there was a death in the family and there was some other things that were happening. And, and as a dietitian, I'll bring it back to how did that affect your eating? So this, the same healthy curiosity, I love your Pringle example. <laughs> it's like, well, I mean, when you said a whole can of Pringles, I'm wondering, is it that little snack size can or the big mm -hmm. one? But, but that was my first question. <laughs> <laughs> right. And so we can't assume. And like you said, we can't know how it's going to land on them. Mm -hmm. And you can check it out with them. And if they say, oh, that was no big deal, what you said, then you move on. Mm -hmm. But But it's really good to check it out with them. Bring the same healthy curiosity and that I'm deeply committed to helping. And that phrase of eating disorders are tricky. And so that's a way of allowing them to not have the defensive. Like, mm -hmm. it's like, oh, she sees me or they see me or he sees mm -hmm. me or they they understand. Or at least they're trying to understand 
what's going on. Because part of the healing that that you all can do when you see these higher weight patients come into your office is actually treating them like eating disorder patients, right? Because for many of these people, like by the time they realized they had an eating disorder and maybe like it brought that up with a provider said like, you know, I read this article in the New York times and I feel like maybe this is my experience too. Maybe I have atypical anorexia. The default for many providers to that patient who's in a fat body is like, and I actually had a, a, one of the patients in my atypical anorexia study, her provider said, you didn't have anorexia, you had binge eating disorder. And that was just solely based on this patient's BMI in the context of a chronic illness that caused that is associated, you know, with significant weight gain. Right. And so that kind of dismissing or that, you know, automatic default of you have an eating disorder, it must be binge eating disorder, which again, I want to also uh, like note that like that stigma associated with binge eating disorder, not good either. Right. And this is a reflection of the hierarchy of eating disorders within our field, which is a reflection of the hierarchy of bodies and, and our association with food bodies and weight. So just by treating your patient, just like a normal patient with an eating disorder, having the same kind of suspicion, the same concern, like, I really want to make sure that you're getting what you need. I really want to make sure that you're not undernourished. I really want to make sure that you're not pushing your body too much in exercise movement or fitness right now, given where you're at in your recovery. Those same concerns that we bring to that thin, emaciated patient, we need to be bringing to our fatter patients who are struggling with the same self-starvation behaviors. Mm -hmm. Regardless of size, Mm-hmm. Most many eating disorders are restrictive eating disorders first, whether it ends in binge eating disorder, whether it ends in anorexia. And this is the mm-hmm. beauty of not being able to diagnose. I can diagnose <laughs> malnutrition and mm-hmm. I can see malnutrition in all body sizes. So it's helpful that I don't have to put someone in a box of <laughs> anorexia, atypical, OSFED, whatever. We could learn uh, a lot from y'all. <laughs> 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 Yeah, it's just really listening in is so important. Janice, I was thinking of you too, because when Aaron was talking about some of the medical providers, you know, we can see, and Janice and I have had conversations about some of the textbooks that really do stigmatize. And I I do hope that we're coming around. It's taking a long time to sh- to shift, but but eating disorders of all weights, a lot of them are restrictive first. And my clients, I use a, an online app for some folks who mm-hmm. aren't too traumatized by by journaling their feelings. Mm-hmm. And they're they're surprised to find out that it is a restrictive eating disorder. Mm-hmm. But exactly like you said, Erin, they've been for so long sort of oppressed into mm-hmm. believing that whatever they're eating, if it's a can of Pringles over 24 hours or, you know, a day, it's, it's not enough. It's not a binge. It's let, let me mm-hmm. see you. This is not enough. There's also a book Jennifer Calvin wrote called I Am Enough. And she went to a dietitian in a general outpatient clinic. And I use that in some of my presentations too, because she was missed. And the dietitian said, you're doing great, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, So those are things that we can use to learn, bring, bring the same healthy curiosity, no matter what size your patient is. Yeah. I had one of the women in my study went to a physician, like in a peak period of her eating disorder, which the behavior she struggled with was restricting, purging and compulsive exercise. And when she went there for the first time in her life, she was in the ideal BMI range. And the nurse who checked her in was just like, wow, this is great. You are, you know, you are in the, you have the perfect weight to height ratio, I think is what she told the patient. And the patient just like clung to that and was like, that's wonderful. You know, and, and I asked her, well, like, what were you doing in the time? And she's like, oh, you know, restricting and purging and exercising. 
And so I asked like, what else was said in the appointment about your weight or your eating behaviors? And she said, that was it. That's the only time I've had a provider, you know, kind of bring those things up. And so essentially what happened is, you know, one, we missed this key opportunity when someone with an eating disorder actually showed up for preventative care, where we, we could have asked that ask those questions. And then two, not only did we miss the opportunity for intervention and referral, we actually strengthened this patient's resolve to continue her eating disorder. Right. And so, and, and that I, I use that example frequently in presentations because we often think that if we're saying something nice to a patient that we are affirming or helping or encouraging that patient. Right. And And when we praise a patient or compliment a patient that we're doing like strengths-based work or, you know, affirming care. And, you know, this is just highlights the dangers of complimenting something like weight loss completely out of context when you don't know what's happening to drive that weight loss. And I, you know, I, I had another patient as well who at 16 years old, and this was also a trans patient, which should raise we should, we should be even more diligent with screening our trans patients who have eating disorders at up to eight times the rate of female patients, cis female, you know, they had lost a hundred pounds as a 16 year old. And when they went back to their physician, the only thing that was said about their weight loss was congratulations. And how'd you do it? And that was it. And, you know, I think of how many illnesses like where weight loss and sudden drastic weight loss is a sentinel symptom that something else is wrong. And obviously in this case, this was also an illness, a life-threatening illness where weight loss is a sentinel symptom that something is wrong and we miss it. We run the risk of missing eating disorders, diabetes, cancers, like there's all kinds of things, it's severe depression. There's all kinds of kind of differential diagnoses that we should be exploring to step slightly out of scope for a moment when a patient is presenting with that kind of drastic weight loss. For sure. I think about the automatic screen if someone's greater than the 85th percentile on the BMI curve to go to weight management. And it's like, okay, so then the psychiatrist goes in and and finds out they're purging. And Mm -hmm. that is not normal ever when you're intentionally purging your food. So Mm -hmm. it's just lazy medicine. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah. Really? So I saw a Grey's Anatomy episode. I just started watching it and I was like, oh my gosh, ahead of their time. This was, I don't know, the second season or something. So like 2008 and they had this larger body patient who came in. I don't even know what she, I can't remember what she was there for. And she was like, I'm in the best shape of my life. I have lost a hundred pounds in the past four months. Like I'm doing incredible. Da, 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 da. And then they went into the surgery and she died because the muscles around her heart were so weak and they called it. They were like, this patient is anorexic and, mm-hmm. you know, went into all the details. I'm like, oh, go Grace Anatomy. Like this, we need to be hearing more of this. And we, I think we were just talking about this at our last recording, Beth, that like you have to just assume you will work with mm-hmm. patients with eating disorders, even if you're not working with patients who quote unquote have eating disorders, like mm-hmm. it's going to be there. Yeah. Regardless of where your setting is, whether it's a hospital or a nursing home or mm-hmm. a a, a gym physical or therapy. physical mm-hmm. therapy for sure, or grocery store dietitian. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Aaron, I have a wrap up question for you and I am curious how you're going to answer this one just with your background, but it's a loaded question. So take your time. But if you were to take yourself back to entering the field of eating disorders, mm-hmm. what do you wish you would have known then that you do know now? Mm. I think, I think it would be around this issue of how much identity and discrimination impacts patients' journeys. I, I think for myself, it was so much easier to see and identify the type of discrimination and stigma that I had personally experienced. And at the time, that wasn't much because I was a thin, white, 
white person doing this work. And so I'd witnessed like some white stigma with family members and that type of thing. And I'd witnessed other types of discrimination, discrimination to like directed towards people. But I think I, I wish I had a more complex understanding of how things like weight and race and gender and sexuality, like how central those issues are to our hearts as people and how wounding it is when those identities are not affirmed in care. So I wish I'd had a bit more just awareness around some of those things. And I think over the years, you know, I've been cultivating my awareness around it, around what it means to present at diverse weights, around what it means, you know, to, for, in terms of gender identity, sexuality, how do we neurodiversity, right? Like how do we incorporate these aspects of our patients' identities into the care that we give them? And I I think associated with that, there was that idea that the best care meant that everybody was treated the same and that the best that I could be was to be impartial and neutral and to, to, to treat everyone in the same best way. And I think what I've, one of the things that I've learned is that being attuned to identity is different than being neutral or the same with identity. And so there are situations that are going to require different approaches. There isn't that kind of cookie cutter thing. And I, I would say relatedly, and this is, if I were to speak from a patient experience, what do I wish my my providers had done differently And I would absolutely say not giving me a weight range (laughs) unequivocally. When I was recovering, my growth charts had been, you know, great BMIs, thin BMIs my entire life. They measured me with a DEXA scan to get my bone density so they could take into account the weight of my bones in my goal weight predictions. You know, they calipered all over my body to find out exactly what my body fat percentage could be. I did VO2 max testing to see kind of like the ideal muscle and fat composition for my body. Cause I was also an athlete and wanted to continue in athletics. All of my labs were run. I had a, an extremely thorough medical workup and was given a five pound weight range from 130 three to 138, which is where they predicted that my adult body would be and stay. And I, I, you you know, for, for context, I'm about twice that weight today Mm -hmm. as a fully recovered individual. And I utterly felt like I had failed recovery when my body moved out of that range. I, uh, I, and then I received that feedback from providers later that I had failed at recovery, right? Like in terms of not maintaining. And that was actually something that I think my inpatient treatment centers asked on follow-up phone calls is like, you know, have you maintained your, your weight range when they're trying to see like how successful they are for these various metrics that they have. And to send that message was extremely damaging and led to multiple other treatment episodes. And I think sometimes as, as providers, you know, we want to believe that we can see into the future and we want to reassure our patients. I was so afraid of gaining weight, Mm -hmm. so afraid of being in a larger body and helping me mourn and grieve that loss of thin privilege, that acceptance that like, I'm going to have to face weight discrimination if I want to live with more freedom, right? Like those, that was key to my healing. And so I absolutely wish that I'd never been told that I should be 138 pounds at -hmm. at my heaviest, you know, and that was, that was very harmful messaging that I received Mm -hmm. from providers as opposed to like, your body is trustworthy and it's been through a lot and you've had disordered eating since a very young age. And so we actually, you know, the best science that we can do, the most VO2 max DEXA scanning uh, testing that we can do is still not we still can't account for the trauma that your body has been through with this starvation. And so we don't know. And we're going to be here with you every step of the way as you walk through that. And no matter where your body ends up, if you are 
nourished and fueled, you're going to be healthier than you are in the depths of anorexia. And even if it means facing more discrimination from society, you can find more freedom than what you have now. And you can have a full life that's worth living as a fat person. That would be, sorry, I'm giving you three things that I wish I had. <laughs> the third, the third thing is that my life is not hopeless as a fat person. Mm -hmm. My, my life is not destined to unhealthiness. It's also not destined to health. I have no guarantees of being disability free, being chronic illness free. And we also know that thin people also have chronic illness, disability, and are unhealthy, right? That, but that as even, even if as, uh, you know, your fully nourished, healthy body is fat, you can still have wonderful relationships, a great career, you know, meaningful work. You can still enjoy your body. I have more peace with my body now at my highest weight than I had at my lowest weight. I don't like it as much. I don't like how it looks as much. And that's a re result of my own weight discrimination that is still there despite all this work that I do. But I have more peace and I'm okay with it. And I can be in a room by myself and not do something that harms myself. I can do something that nourishes myself or takes yes. care of myself. And that's a very different place. Erin, I'm going to tell you, we didn't even get to talk about, you talked about being attuned to identity and you gave a stat about eight times more eating disorders in the trans population. That's a whole nother episode. <laughs> and one of my favorite handouts as we wrap up is the 12 things that signs of recovery and none of them have to do with weight. Mm -hmm. And so I give that to my clients and we'll go over it and it's loaded. Sometimes we can't even get through three of them in a session before, uh, you know, because there's so many questions and comments. We're so used to looking at weight and it's like, you know, are you sleeping well? How's your digestive tract? Mm -hmm. What's your energy level? Are you able to choose foods freely? Are you, those are things that are, have nothing to do with a number on the scale. Mm -hmm. So thank you, Erin, for joining all of us today. Thank you so much for having me. Let's lean on each other and learn from each other so we can grow together as professionals in this field of eating disorders. If you want to connect with me for supervision or membership with monthly content, please find me at bethharrell.com slash professionals.